recording is on as well. Yep, I think it's on. All right, good morning, uh, everyone. Um, before we continue just talking about symmetric functions, just two quick remarks. One, the first one was sort of as, I mean, uh, was coming up in one of the, uh, the questions that, that people handed in. It's a very, very minor point, but at some point there were expressions like one minus q to the power n divided by one minus q. This was sort of taking the limit of a q binomial to go to just the ordinary binomial coefficient. And there were quite a few who appealed to L'Hopital's rule. Now, uh, there's nothing wrong with L'Hopital, of course, but it doesn't really belong in sort of in representation theory, algebraic combinatorics, and, and symmetric functions. To us, 1 minus q to the power n divided by 1 minus q really means it's just a polynomial 1 plus q dot 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 up to q to the power n minus 1, okay? Certainly, we would like to also have expressions like this as alphabets, right? Everything is formal. So the idea of sort of saying, oh, we're taking limits, that sort of doesn't really fit this kind of business very well. So it's best to not do that. And really, when you read something like this, this is what you're thinking, okay? We're not analysts here. Well, maybe, of course, when we get to probability, which I probably won't, this, then, then the story changes entirely. But at this formal level, we would rather not talk about limits. Even though we might write lim something goes to that, we don't really mean a limit in the sort of sense that like, we're doing analysis here. We're not, okay? Then the other question that was asked by a number of people, well, these binomial variables, why are they called binomial? Right, so these were sort of these funny objects that we use inside alphabets, but they don't actually denote a letter of an alphabet. They denote, well, a scalar or a binomial variable. Why are they called that? Well, if you take a power sum and you take an alphabet and you add a binomial variable, again, this is not, this is sort of by abuse of notation. If you read something like this, that really means a binomial variable multiplying a trivial alphabet that has just one letter and that letter happens to be one. But of course, this is painful to write this all the time, so we would simply write x plus psi. Well, if we apply our rules, whenever you see a plus inside a power sum, it's just the sum of the two power sums. So this would be the power sum of psi times a trivial alphabet. But remember, a binomial variable, you can pull it out. You get a power sum of just one, which is simply, well, one raised to the power r. That's always going to be just one. So this is pr plus psi. So that means if you stick this into the generating function, then, well, this first bit is just going to give you the generating function again. And then this psi bit, you simply pick up a log. All right, it's just a trivial series identity. So now that means if you remember that the generating function of the complete symmetric functions, I'm not even going to denote the alphabet, right? We have this nice relation that upstairs here everything is additive, downstairs here everything becomes multiplicative. So over here we get again the generating function back, but rather than the sum, it's now a product. That's what we have. The log, of course, goes away. And now if you expand this, and that's where the binomial comes from, if you expand this using the binomial theorem that allows you to extract the coefficients of z, and so you see that the complete symmetric function, if you add a binomial variable, well, you can expand it into complete symmetric functions again, and the coefficients in that expansion are precisely, well, I haven't written it here, here I've actually extracted the coefficients. These are precisely binomial, okay? So that's where the term comes from. Um, not sure how significant it is, but in any case, given that a number of people asked the question, here's the answer, okay? So, but, I mean, as Jules po pointed out to me, that Adriano Garcia just refers to it as a scalar. If that's what you want to use. As I said, I was just raised by Alain Lascaux, and he always called them binomial, so I've just adopted that notation, okay? So, all right, hopefully that clarifies sort of two things that have come up. And so let's now get back to 
a ring of symmetric functions. And well, in, a, in a moment, I'm going to define this, the sure functions. And as it will turn out, and I may not actually get that today, but I think it will be on a question that you'll be doing later this morning anyway, that we're going to define a scalar product on the ring of symmetric functions. And it turns out that the sure functions, they're orthonormal with respect to that scalar product. OK? So, and that scalar product is known as the whole scalar product. OK? Let's first give a definition. So let x and y be two alphabets. OK? So then we say then, well, we already had the notion of the product of alphabets, right? If x and y were just ordinary sets that you could count, it was literally just the Cartesian product, OK? But we def define it more generally using the power sums. But in any case, there's another type of product. So then the, what we call this Cauchy product, of x and y is defined as simply take the, remember, this was the generating function for the complete symmetric functions, but I don't care about the z there. I just set it equal to 1. And so you take the Cartesian product, but you stick it inside of this generating function. OK, well, that's just a definition, so let's not worry about it. OK, so then ha we have a little lemma. If we want to expand this in terms of, well, some of the known bases that we've discussed, so for example, the power sums, Remember, here's again this size of the centralizer indexed by lambda that we always see in this kind of business. OK? And also, Complete symmetric functions now indexed by partition. Remember, if you index one of these functions by partition, it's just the product of each of, the, of these functions. The same applies to the power sums, where you just take the individual parts of that partition. But not so for the monomial symmetric function. That was immediately defined on partitions, of course. OK? So we have this. And later, it will turn out that so maybe just I promise you to mention this because I don't get to there. But later, we will also see that this is also equal to sum over lambda. I haven't yet defined what this is, but that's going to be the sure function I'll define in a moment. So that's a third way to expand this Cauchy product. Okay, so we have sort of lots of expansions here. If you're unhappy about this, because it's a bit unfair, you might say, well, I've got the power sums, the completes, the monomials, and the sures that I'm yet to define. I don't do anything with the elementaries. But I already told you that to me, an elementary symmetric function is the same as a complete symmetric function, just on a different alphabet, the negative of it. So I don't need to talk about it. In fact, if you take, there's also a relation like this for the elementaries, but then the monomial on the, its negative, well, Anyway, the monomial symmetric function is then replaced by this forgotten symmetric function. And it's forgotten for a good reason, so it's not very interesting. So let's not worry about that. Well, the first line is completely trivial because we simply had, that was one of the things we did last time, Right, where the z lambda first occurred. Okay, so 
hopefully you remember this. So from that, all I do is just stick in x. I replace this by x times y. So again, it's just one of these statistic substitutions that you've all checked now that they're fine, they're homomorphisms, so nothing wrong here. B lambda of x times y, but all right, that's the end of it. Again, this was something you have also verified in one of the questions. I only did this for a single part rather than on a partition, but it immediately implies, of course, this. So done with the first one. So there's really, I don't have to do any work whatsoever. I just get that for free, okay? So let's take the second one, okay? So should I label them? Well, no, I think it's, okay? So for the second one, so now I have a complete symmetric function here and a monomial symmetric function. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, so note that if I have x times y, okay, well, okay. So let's first, let's note two things. So it suffices to consider, otherwise what I was going to say would have been false, to consider why I take this to be an actual traditional alphabet that's also a set. And it's good enough to do this for finite n as long as I do this for any n, right? This was the stability that we may as well work with a finite number of variables, okay? so. That's the first remark. Then, so then we can say x times y is nothing but the sum over, well, I've labeled them, 1 up to n, x times, okay? So this is, if you wish, just a Cartesian product of x with a single letter here. And that tells me that Sigma 1, in that particular case of x times y, is simply, remember, sigma has multiplicative properties. Like this, and now I have to label. Okay, everyone clear what I'm doing here? So I just, if I have something like that, so remember that, right, sigma z of x, that was essentially, right, it's the, it's the same as sigma 1 of, okay, there's, there's no distinction here. All right, so now each of these is the generating function of a complete symmetric function that indexed by a difference. So this z here is usually it's keeping track of when you do the generating function. So now rather than one z, I have y1, y2 up to a yn. Okay, so let's continue here. So if I use that, I find that sigma 1 of x times y, okay, I have, that's just a product, well, okay, so I'll write down here again what I had previously, and now I'm going to expand each of these in the generating function, okay, and so let me use alpha i for the i expansion here. And so rather than a z, I'm supposed to write a yi. Okay, and I need to sum, of course. Alpha i. 
So now I'm just collecting all of these alpha. So I have an alpha 1 up to an alpha n. So set alpha to alpha n. So this is such a thing. So that's a weak composition. In other words, uh, in this case, a sequence of length n where all of the entries are non-negative integers, because that's what we are, right? I didn't write that here, but that's what, we, what we've got. OK, so now we're just summing over these weak compositions. And then I'll just write symbolically as we did before, right? This means y1 to the power alpha 1, y2 to the power alpha 2, and so on. We've seen this before. And then, of course, I get the product over i, h alpha i of x. OK, but of course, each composition is in an Sn orbit of some partition. OK. So now we're summing over actual partitions. OK, well, here, I'm, it doesn't really matter what the order is of these alpha i, so it's immediately. I can write this, OK? Because if I permute the alpha i, it doesn't change this product of n terms. But now, of course, we must sum over all alphas in the Sn orbit of lambda. And I hope you remember that's exactly the monomial symmetric function. Oops, but of course it should have been a y. That's what we had over there. OK. And so that gives me times m lambda of y. OK. And, and then we're done. OK. So that's a little bit more work, but still not terribly terribly complicated. Any questions about that? OK, so as I said, we've now seen that this Cauchy product, so essentially what we're doing in these things, of course, we're completely separating the, L, the alphabets x and y in these sum forms that we have over here. OK, and as I also mentioned, we have something similar for the Shures. All right. Everyone, okay, yes. La yes, yes, later, there's a third expansion of this Cauchy product in terms of the Schur functions, but I have not yet defined the Schur functions, and it turns out, yes. So that will, I think I'll prove that tomorrow, um, because that's a little bit more work, even though I'll, pro I'll define the Schur function in a moment. Well, the... The most beautiful way to prove that for sure is using something known as RSK, and I just have no time to explain that because then we need another week. So I'm going to use something that's the Jacobi Trudy identity, and again, I need a little bit of more stuff before I can, before I can get there. So we're not going to prove that today, but. Okay, so now we can define this, the whole scalar product. Okay, so we have, which takes us from, okay. Lambda cross lambda back to lambda. Well, not to lambda. That's not what I should write here. I guess for us, we should really, if we're working over z still, then something like that. And how is it defined? Well, well, okay. Let's do. It doesn't really matter. Let's take the. Let me write the completes first. Oops, and this should be a mu. OK, 
Okay, that's the definition for us. As I said, it's not the only way to define it. There's a whole bunch of equivalent definitions, but that's good enough. Okay? And as I already mentioned, turns out that the, okay, that the sure functions are of a normal with respect to this scalar product. That's really why it's so important. Which shouldn't surprise you, so again, if you're familiar with representation theory, this is the right thing, because the sure functions are characters of GLN, and they are just the essential orthogonality of characters, okay? But the point is, of course, that this definition at the level of symmetric functions is exactly the same as what you get if you do, if you do representation theory, okay? Um, all right, so, The remark, um, H lambda, let me write it like that, and I mean this is almost an empty remark, but it's generally true, are sort of dual bases with respect to the whole scalar product, and, it, and it more generally, okay, if you have a pair of bases such that if you stick them in your inner product, you get the delta function, and we call these dual bases, okay? So the point is that the sure basis, it's dual to itself, okay? Again, I'm getting ahead of myself, okay? All right, so more generally, If a a basis of lambda such that Okay, so that's a term that we use in a more general setting, okay? All right, so what does this have to do with this Cauchy product I defined earlier? Well, it turns out, so these types of identities, if you have something like an expansion like that, is essentially equivalent to saying that your orthogonal with respect to the, <coughs> to the whole scalar product, okay? So that's now my, going to be, maybe I'll leave this up for another moment. I mean, I will need that board space in a sec, but at least let me first state the next. Next result, and I'm not sure if I thought it was worthy of a, an actual, I, I call it a proposition here, Okay, so let's do that here. Let's also call the proposition. Again, the, the proof itself is straightforward, so it's not something that's deep, but it's reasonably important. So let, okay, so A lambda and B lambda be bases. of my ring of symmetric functions. Well, then the claim is you have this if and only if you have that same relation at the level of the, so then, okay, so then A lambda E mu, so they're dual bases. if and only if the 
this is going to exactly give you this Cauchy product of x and y. Okay? So that's how we will later show that the Schur function is indeed that is a dual basis by instead of working directly with the whole scalar product, we'll show that the Schur function, that was this remark later, if we show that this holds, then we're done if you believe this proposition here, okay? Sorry? Oh, oh, I have no B. That, that <laughs> thank you. Yeah, that's a <laughs> absolutely. I need a B here, of course. Yes, now that would be a, a truly amazing statement, right? If the B on one side completely disappeared. <laughs> Thanks. All right. So, well, So all we're going to do, given that A and B are bases, and the monomial and the complete symmetric functions are also bases, so I can simply expand, okay? So I can say that A lambda is some coefficients. Let me write a new here, and then a complete symmetric function. And for B, and let me write B of mu here, Maybe use a D, and I think I find it more convenient to now put the, so I need another letter, and then I use the monomial. Okay, so there exist some coefficients so I can expand in this other basis, right? I can always do that. All right, so then, well, if we, as I said, it's a bit of a tedious, but not very difficult. So here, of course, I'm summing over that. Here, I'm summing over that. So here we get nu and omega c lambda nu d omega nu. But now we get an h. Okay, but by my the way I define my whole scalar product. This is just delta, okay? So in other words, I can get rid of my omega there. So this is nu, c lambda nu, d nu, nu. And, well, if that's equal to that, then we can, I want to leave that there for a moment. That certainly tells me that this left-hand side, maybe I can at least, hopefully you can read that. So let me just call this the left-hand side is the same as okay, well that that sum must be just this here, okay? So that's the same as saying sum over nu c lambda nu D nu mu is just delta lambda nu, okay? So in other words, if you put this, if you think of these as matrices, they're just each other's inverse, right? No big surprises there, okay? Rightio, so now we just take the other side. And of course, we get exactly the same. And that's essentially the end of the proof. Okay. So if we take, so what do I have? Lambda, let me try to get it right this time. A lambda of x, and now I write b lambda of y, okay, so that was equal to sigma 1, all 
So therefore, given that I know that sigma 1 of x times y is also this, I get this is the same as the sum over lambda, h lambda of x times m lambda of y, okay, but this is of course also Again, I mean, I should maybe stop because everyone can see what's going on. I'm just wasting your time. If on the other side, I, again, I um, use the fact that A and B can be expanded like this. Okay, well, I'll go one more step and then I'll leave the rest for homework. So what did we say? A of lambda. Okay, so I'll pick up another new here and maybe also a something like this. That would be my C lambda nu, and on the other side I get a, I said D of lambda, so that's a D omega of lambda, okay? And now I get here, I got H of nu of X, and then I get an M of omega of Y, right? Everyone okay with this? So now, of course, given that this must be the same as that, okay, so if I extract coefficients, so take the coefficients of, well, And let me just write it as, for example, something like that. In general, okay, I have two different alphabets, so, right, these are essentially in two different spaces, so I can do this double coefficient expansion. On this side, I would precisely get, well, so, so then on, let's say, the right hand side, what do I get? I get delta, well, what is it? Delta mu lambda, so again, I get a delta function, and on the left-hand side, well, you'll see, I again, I get this sum, and so let me just write, I get this sum here, and you can fill in the details. There's nothing, right? There's nothing really significant going on. You just get exactly that same relation again with I should perhaps say the only thing that will be different is the order of the D, the C and the D. So this thing here, but again, you're too intelligent for me to, to tell you this. This, of course, also means that if we have D, whatever, lambda, sum over lambda, say, eta, C, that's also going to be delta, well, what is it? And that's the form that you'll get out of here. As I said, I better not, it's, it's a completely uninteresting calculation. So that's all, okay? So I better get to some, some more interesting things, unless, unless there are questions about this. But as I said, it's just a, nothing more than just changing the basis twice on, on both these expressions and you get the same orthogonality relation and, and you're done, okay. All right, so let's really talk about the sure functions because it's taken too long to get there. And that's really the function we're actually interested in. Okay, so
All right, so let's just give the definition first. And so, let, so I start with the partition. of length. So I'm first going to define the Schur function on n variables, and then later we're going to extend this to the Schur functions on infinitely many variables. Uh, but because I start with n variables, I need to put a restriction on the length of my partition in what I'm going to say here. So then, so then the Schur function now, okay, is defined as so an n by n determinant divided by, and I'm just going to write like that, which is just a Van der Mont product. So I should tell you what that is. So where And again, if you know representation theory, this, this is an example of essentially a denominator, a wild denominator here, but okay. All right, so that's just the definition of the Schur function. All right, so just a determinant divided by this product here. So we have to ask ourselves some questions. First of all, is this a polynomial? Then is it symmetric? Maybe what is the degree of that polynomial? And then most importantly, is this perhaps also a basis of a ring of symmetric functions in n variables? And of course, the answer to all of these questions is yes. Well, apart I said, what is the degree? Yes is not the answer to that. The degree is precisely the size of the partition, but okay. Um, all right, so maybe I'll put that in a lemma. Okay, so S lambda is, and that's a list, a polynomial. It's symmetric. degree of S lambda is just the size of the, so remember, that's just the sum of the parts of the partition. So for us, only goes up to N. And I take these and again, I restrict my length and maybe I fix the degree to be equal to k is the basis okay, of the kth degree piece of our ring of symmetric functions in n variables. Okay? That's of course the most crucial statement here. All right. Again. In view of the time, 
I'm not going to go through the details. I'll just tell them to you. I've written them in the notes, which uh, we put up online anyway, if you can't follow my argument. So just look at the determinant at the top. Of course, if two, if x and certain xi is equal to an xj, it just means that two rows of my determinant become identical, so my determinant will vanish. So in other words, this numerator determinant can certainly be divided by every xi minus xj, and so therefore this is obviously a polynomial. Okay? So we can give the first statement a tick. Well, why is it symmetric? Well, again, if you interchange two rows of your determinant, which is interchanging an xi and an xj, all right, well, we all know then we are going to, right, if we swap, we get minus signs, so the numerator is a skew symmetric function, all right, if I interchange x1 and x2, all I do is I generate a minus sign, but we can all check that this denominator is all skew symmetric function or anti symmetric function, whatever language you prefer. And so the ratio of two of such functions, if you take the ratio of two skew symmetric functions or the ratio of two anti symmetric functions, you get something that is symmetric. Okay? So also the symmetry should be clear. Well, the degree. Well, the degree of the numerator is just, again, if you just do the expansion, just look at all of the columns where you have these lambda j's plus n minus j. You pick up a term from each column if you expand the determinant. So indeed, you get the sum of all of the lambdas and then the sum of all of these n minus j's, which is just form the staircase partition, which will give you sort of an n choose 2. Well, and we can all check that the degree of this denominator, this van der Mond product, is also n choose 2, so they disappear. And again, you just get that degree. Again, if that's too quick for you, it's probably just a good exercise to do it for yourself. But there's nothing too, too deep about that. So the only thing we need to perhaps really check is that this is going to form a basis. Well, if I fix the degree, if this is going to form a basis of the kth degree piece of my ring of symmetric functions. Okay, so, so the first, well, let's say point one, we have give that a tick. Point two, we've given it a tick. Point three, we've given it a tick. Okay, so now the last one. Well, so I'm going to know, so let a n Okay, so now I'm going to look at just the denominator of the just the numerator term. And I'm going to essentially rather than looking at symmetric functions, I'm going to look at skew symmetric functions. Okay? So just like I said, this numerator is skew symmetric. Okay? So well. And we don't really need even a, let me just say the skew symmetric functions. Okay, we really only, I'm only looking at this k degree piece at the end, so I'm only interested to show that these things sort of as free z modules are isomorphic, okay? And so that's going to be enough for us. Well, if I want a basis, so think back about the monomial symmetric functions. What did we do with the monomial symmetric functions? We started just out with a single monomial index A or with exponent to partition, and then we realized, oh, this is not symmetric. And so we essentially, okay, let me just write it here. Well, okay, I think we wrote it like that. I need to essentially symmetrize that. And then we said, well, you shouldn't take all permutations, but only those that are in the sort of orbit of lambda, so you don't get some terms more than once. Okay. 
So now if you're interested in skew symmetric functions, you, want, you do something similar. If you take a monomial, that's not going to be a basis, because that's not going to be skew symmetric. So now rather than symmetrizing, if you start with a single monomial, you need to anti-symmetrize. Okay? That will give you a skew symmetric function, and that will therefore automatically give you a sort of a basis. Okay? So, so also say let mu. So now I have to be careful. If I start anti-symmetrizing, if I start with a partition such that, for example, two parts of that partition are the same. Maybe a partition like 1, 1, 2. Okay? So, well, apparently if I sort of swap the variables x1 and x2, I want to pick up a minus sign, but if I swap x1 and x2, nothing is, right? The, these exponents are not going to change. So, in other words, if I want the basis, and I don't want vanishing, I don't want zero polynomials to be part of my basis, I need to restrict myself to strict partitions, or, right, so let B is strict, and I haven't used that term before, partition. So that means all parts distinct. Okay. So then, well, so then I'm anti-symmetrizing. So in other words, this thing where now I've taken a strict partition, if I anti-symmetrize x to the power of mu, so I should really write a j here, this is going to be an element I need in my basis, okay? So in other words, these, and again, I've now used mu, so of course I don't want this to be greater than n, and as I said, mu is strict. Well, that forms a basis. But now I can easily determine an isomorphism with lambda. given by, so, well, so let's say it doesn't matter which direction I go. All I do is I take a symmetric function and I just multiply it with the Vandermond. Well, so I should really say F, let me Right? If I have something that's symmetric and I multiply by an anti-symmetric function, I've got something that's anti-symmetric. Okay? All right, so that's good. But, so what about these strict partitions? Well, so further note, that if mu is strict, then lambda, so well, I should really, if I have a strict partition, okay, so something like 4, 2, 1, 
right? If I subtract nothing here, I subtract 1 here, I subtract 2 here, I just get an arbitrary partition, okay? So, in other words, that arbitrary partition, so I can write what this is. I can't remember if I already introduced this notation. In general, okay, staircase partition. Okay, that's precisely where's my definition of the Schur function. All right. So what previously was my strict partition mu j, I've now expressed this as an ordinary partition plus, right, these are the components of my delta here. Okay? So, so that's really all all I need to say about that, okay? Um, yes? Sorry, D? It's not necessarily exactly, well, of mu here, it has to be strict, but I could have a zero at the end, so the length is at most n. It certainly, that means the length must be at least, right, n minus 1, because I cannot have two zeros at the end, because then it's no longer strict. Whereas for my partition lambda here, because essentially compared with mu, I've subtracted this staircase partition, it's quite possible that this partition is completely empty. That's still part of my partitions of length less than or equal to n. But let me first just at least write down the conclusion. So, so from this it follows, well, that's exactly what I wrote over here. Okay, so that S lambda, where lambda is a partition of size k and the length is at most n, is a free. Sorry, a basis, I wanted to say, is a basis of the, and let's just, let's not use any complicated language, okay? So, as I said, the, the argument is really that these things are basis, the trivial basis, the natural basis, just as natural as the monomial symmetric functions are the natural basis of the ring of symmetric functions. The, skew symmetric or anti-symmetric functions, and the only way to form them naturally is just taking, right, the anti-symmetrizer, which is taking the determinant, and then we realize that just by multiplying by the Vandermont, you get something that is symmetric. That's the link between these two spaces, and, and essentially that is all, okay? All right, anyway, so that's the Schur function. I should say, because this is, again, coming back in, so I can add that here as a remark. I've defined the Schur functions now for, so let me, this can, of course, also be written as, sum over, right, the determinant is nothing but the sum over the symmetric group. X, and then we get here lambda i plus n minus i, still divided by the Vandermont. Okay? So, well, whichever form you prefer, of course, these definitions make perfect sense if I not, don't restrict myself to partitions, but general compositions of at most n parts, okay? So note, 
we can define S alpha in exactly the same way, well, let's say alpha composition in the same way. But, well, given that we already have a basis, of course, it's still going to be symmetric, because nothing that I've said depended on the fact that lambda was a partition. For composition, everything still remains. So obviously, they are no longer independent. OK, so then, well, if, if alpha, there's that same delta staircase partition, if you have this, OK, and it's precisely coming from essentially you want to rearrange these. If this is not a partition, you want to reorder them so that it becomes a partition. So you need to carry out a little bit of permutation. So if you can find a permutation such that, that alpha plus delta can be written as permutation acting on lambda plus delta, then S of alpha is simply the sign of that permutation times S of lambda, and otherwise it's going to be zero. Okay? Otherwise, S of alpha just vanishes. Okay? All right that this is in one of the exercises and it, it's useful. Okay. So now what we want to do is give a more combinatorial description. Well, okay, first, and I'm going well, again, I'm going too slow, so I'll leave this as an exercise, because it's completely trivial again. S lambda is stable. In other words, what does it mean? So I E. If I set the last variable to zero, that's if the length of lambda is less than or equal to n minus 1. But if it's not, if it has length exactly n, and it vanishes. And you can immediately see this from this definition here, right? So the xn, that's just the final row of my determinant. Now the rightmost element, so all of these xn's, because they are a partition plus a bit coming from the staircase partition, and the staircase partition is always positive exact for, except for its very last entry which is zero, so it's clear that the bottom row, right, where you have things raised to the power, dot, 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 all of these are positive powers, so if xn is zero, they vanish, except for perhaps the last one. If, if lambda n is zero, then that's a zero plus n minus n, that's an so then your determinant just has a 1 in the right down bottom, all right? So your determinant will just have a 1 here and zeros everywhere here. And, well, it's trivial. You just get the smaller one. But otherwise, if all of these entries are strictly positive, and I said xn equal to 0, it just vanishes, okay? So 
Again, this is not something that is difficult to see. And of course, you have to check. Well, in the Vandermond product, if xn, you set it equal to zero, you get a whole product of x1 up to xn minus one. You bring it upstairs, and that changes this n to an n minus one, and that's why you get it, okay? So again, it's a little algebraic exercise, but not very hard. And so, so as a result, we can define uh, on infinitely many variables. Okay, so there is also a sure function in lambda, not just in lambda n, just by the same procedure that we described earlier. Okay? So I said the determinant definition is not very handy for that because you get it on n variables, then you need to use stability to push it all the way to infinity. Of course, there's better descriptions where you get that immediately, but all right. So We want a better, more combinatorial description of the Schur function, which sort of shows, well, if you know about the wild character formula, you already recognize that this is the wild character formula for SLN or GLN. So the Schur functions are characters of both SLN and GLN. There's an exercise, or maybe you already did that one, where it's related to characters of the symmetric group as well. So there's a lot of representation theory behind this. So you should expect that you can also write this in a more combinatorial way that reflects this a little bit better, okay? And, and that's what I'm going to do now. And I only have half an hour for it. So the semi-standard, so let's put this in the definition. The semi standard Young tableau uh, of shape lambda and and this is annoying because the people don't agree content weight filling McDonald uses has another meaning for the word content, but I don't think anyone else uses it, et cetera. So you can come up, well, is a, well, let's say on n letters, uh, well, and filling, I should have given this a symbol, alpha is a, well, it's a filling of the of the Young diagram of lambda with well, one up to n such that well, if we go to the right, we are weakly increasing and if we go down we are strictly increasing okay well that needs an example I haven't seen this before sorry oh and I need something about the alpha such that there are alpha i boxes filled with the letter i, okay? So, example, let's just make up a 
partition, 5, 3, 2, 2, 1. Don't want to make it too big. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 3, 2, 2, and 1. OK, I'm not yet going to tell you what alpha is. I'm first doing the filling, and then I'll read off alpha. Otherwise, I'm getting myself into trouble. So maybe something like this, 2, another 2, and a 5, whatever, 2, 3, and 3, 4, and a 4, 5, 6, and maybe another 6. OK, so that's lambda. And so our alpha, how many ones? Two, how many twos? Two, how many threes? Three twos, good. Uh, otherwise, it seemed like everything was constant here. I think two threes and two fours, two fives, two sixes? Geez, I am, well, we should check that these numbers add up to the same. Eight, 10, that's 13. And that's also 13, so this is possibly correct, okay? And otherwise, you'll, you'll correct it for me, okay? So this is, and I'll say this is an element of semi-standard young tableau. So lambda, 5, 3, 2, 2, 1, and and another 2, right? Okay, so of course that's not the only filling with this shape and this content here, right? Um, I could have done it differently. I could, for example, swap this, this three and that two and it would still be a valid filling. Okay, so there's many ways. If I give you a lambda and an alpha in general, there's many ways to do this. Okay, any questions about that? Because this is an important definition. All right, so in view of the proof that I'm going to, so I want to express my young or my uh, sure function in terms of these semi-standard young tableau. So to note A is equivalent to a sequence of interlacing partitions so let's do it for our example I start with so again eg Start with the empty partition, and now I just look at all of the ones that forms the partition two. Now I look at all of the ones and the twos. That's the partition three, two. Hopefully you can check that we're interlacing. Then ones, twos, and threes. So that's, so that wasn't right. There was a four here, right? Four and a one rather than four two. So I'm not doing a great job here. Okay, four and one. Now I add the threes. That's four and three. And I add the fours to it. So that's four, three, and two. And the five. So I get a, let's write it here. Five, three, two, and one. And then finally, with the sixes there, I get, what is it? Five, three, two, two, and one, which is equal to my partition lambda. Okay, is that example clear? So I just, this is my first partition, this is my second partition. This here is my third partition, and so on. And you can check that the 
rules for being semi-standard is precisely telling me that all these partitions interlace. OK? So I said that's, that's important. So if you don't like semi-standard Young tableau, you can just work in terms of sequences of interlacing partitions. OK? All right. So let's now give the theorem sure and let, OK. So it's usually written like this because that's nice and short, but that really means so you can have any content that fits into that shape. Now, OK, let us for us, you can do this in infinitely many variables, but let's make it a bit more easy here. So if we have n variables, so this is a tableau on, OK, so then we only have the letters 1 up to n if we work with n variables, OK? And then what you do here is x really to, to the content of that tableau, OK? Which, if that's not clear what that is to you, that's just x1 to the alpha 1. xn to the alpha n if alpha happens to be the content of my tableau t. Okay, so every filling gives you a monomial. So for example, here we get the monomial x1 squared, x2 cubed, x3 squared, and I think the rest was all squares, right? OK, so every tableau just generates one monomial. And so apparently, if we add up all these monomials, we get something that's symmetric. So that's already not so clear. OK? So, so note, if the theorem is true, then, and I'll show in a moment that it's true, that tells us that well the number of because after all we should get something that is symmetric and one can get all fillings are allowed so apparently if i permute the filling numbers I get the same cardinality, OK? And this number can also be written just by definition, and then that's known as the Kostka number. That's sim so that number simply tells you how many semi-standard Young tableau with a given shape and a given filling there are, OK? And I have to watch the time because, well, I think I can still finish my proof. Maybe I'll go two minutes over time, but I always do. I do want to make this remark that, let's see what can go here, maybe these interlacing partitions. Because these numbers, these Koska numbers, these multiplicities, again, this is a much more general concept, so I just want to mention more generally, if G is a semi standard, well, not semi, now I need to change my language, semi simple. 
Lee algebra and V lambda is an irreducible representation. And again, if you don't know what these things are, that's fine. Okay, but for those who, who do know representation theory, it is important to make that connection. Uh, well, so then we have the character. So essentially, if you have an irreducible representation that breaks up into what are known as weight spaces, and you want to know the weight space decomposition, and as I said, don't worry if you're not familiar with that. Well, okay, I'm just going to write the dimension here. Uh, maybe already, let me immediately, I mean, it's usually not written like that, but it connects immediately what we have over here, okay? So this, so I'll just write what it is. This is the dimension of the weight space uh, labeled by the weight mu, okay? So in generally, these numbers here, the dimensions of spaces, okay? They give you the multiplicity. Uh, of these weight spaces. And I had an example, for example, for SL2. It's also in the notes, so you don't need to copy it. But for example, if I take a particular representation here of SL2, SL3, I should say, not SL2, terrible. Yes. So it's a highest weight representation where this is the highest weight. And I've given you the labeling with this little young tableau. And it turns out that there are a bunch of other weight spaces in this weight space decomposition, all of them are one dimensional because all of them have only one young tableau attached to them, except for the one in the middle, because there the filling is one, two, and three. And there's two ways of doing this that's telling me that this space here is two dimensional and all of these other spaces are one dimensional. Okay? So, as I said, this Koska number. In a more general setting, it's giving you dimensions of certain spaces. And this is a very nice combinatorial rule. If you don't want to know about Lie algebra theory and or you find this too complicated, you can just, you can just do it. Anyone can do this. All right? You just start filling, of course. Of course, for other types, you no longer have these nice tableau. I mean, for some other types, for sort of we have for type C, we have complicated analogs of this young tableau. If I go to E6 or so, you'll just have to work with that language. And there's, of course, there's other formulas to compute these multiplicities. Again, one of the exercises, is that one of the exercises you're going to do today? Is about another formula, Kostan's multiplicity formula for computing this. Okay, so there's other avenues to that same number. Okay, I should rush because I want to um, give you a proof of, of this theorem. Before my time is up, so. Okay. So let's see how we can prove this, okay? So, well, the first thing I'm going to do, so I'm going to start. So we need to connect this because the only other thing we've got is the determinant definition. So at the end of the day, I need to rewrite that as the determinant. Okay? Seems like a bit of a pain because that's very combinatorial and the determinant is not. Okay, well, so if I take this, I already mentioned to you, rather than summing over Tableau, I can sum over these sequences of horizontal strips. And now what is my x alpha? 
Alpha 1 is the number of 1s I've got. The number of 1s is precisely the size of this partition minus that partition. That's just the size of this partition. The size of how many 2s? Well, this partition here, the second one in my interlacing sequence, was all the 1s and the 2s. That's too much. I only want the 2s, so I need to subtract that. So, in other words, it's simply... That's it. That's the exponent that I have. That's the content. Okay. Well, let me write lambda n minus 1 as mu. So then... So that's the one immediately to the left of this one. And then, okay, so that's taking care of the nth term there. And then everything else up to that mu, that's just another sure function by that same definition. now on n minus 1 variables. Okay, so essentially what I've done, I've peeled off this trip where all the n's are, and then realized that the rest is just going to generate the sure function on n minus 1 variables. Okay? So, so this is known the branching rule. Okay, again, the term branching comes from representation theory. So here you would be taking GLN, and now you restrict yourself to GLN minus 1, and you ask yourself, how do, how do my irreducibles decompose? That's this formula here. Okay, anyway, again, you don't need the representation theory necessarily, but it's, of course, all there. Okay, so now we only need to prove this branching rule. And so maybe we can get that from the determinant. Maybe we can even do that in five minutes. Well, maybe, maybe ten, but it's not too bad. Okay? Well, because everything is homogeneous of degree lambda, so I can just set one of my variables equal to one, okay? I can always put it back in at the end. It's just slightly more convenient, okay? So then the branching rule takes the form so what happens so I'm going to write this in statistic notation okay so on the left we have x hope I'm going to weld it but okay well you should think of this x here but I'm writing this for more general alphabets this is your x1 up to xn minus 1 because I've set xn equal to 1, so that's this plus 1 here, okay? And, okay, so that's in statistic notation, and this is for any alphabet, okay? Anyway, I'm not really going to, I just want to restate this, because again, it, it occurs in one of the exercises. So we want to get this here, and now we go back to the determinant. And it's just a lot less bookkeeping because I've said xn equal to 1. You don't really, if you don't like that, well, you can put all the xn's back in, but all of the formulas become really ugly, and it would 
probably not get it done correctly, OK? So, the, so let's now try x n minus 1, and then we set a 1. So what happens to our determinant? The first n minus 1 rows don't change. OK, so this is for i less than n. But we get ones in the final row, so that's just and then I get the, the Vandermond, and I'll just for brevity I'll write it n minus one, just to say this is on n minus one variables. And the last product in my Vandermond, which was every xi minus xn. But xn is 1, so I get this. OK? Everyone happy with that? All I've done is taken the definition and set xn equal to 1. So now if I subtract the final row from all of the other rows, I get an xi to some power minus 1. And now in the ith row, I put this back in. So that is, all right, so then I get, all right, so I get something like xi to some power. I had subtracted 1, and then I divide by this. So that would be a sum. And I don't know what is a convenient variable here. Ri from 0 up to lambda j plus n minus j minus 1 xi. And here, I still have a 1. And I divide all of that by the Vandermont on n minus 1 variables, OK? Everyone happy with that? I have subtracted the final row from all of the other rows. So take row i and do minus row n. OK, that's what I've done. And then I've divided that by xi minus 1. Hopefully that's clear. And now. Rather than work with the rows, I'm going to work with the columns. So I take the first column and I subtract the second column. And then I take the second column and I subtract the third column. So here what I do is C1 goes to C1 minus C2. Then, so I have to do this in the right order, C2 goes to C2 minus C3, etc. I do this for all of them. I get the determinant. But now, well, I've subtract, if I subtract the previous one, OK, then it should be something like, or the sort of the column to the right, so the j is one bigger. j is, I think, I, but this is still minus 1. And I get lambda j plus n minus j minus 1. Sorry, rj. I forgot to write the, sorry, r, what was it? I said ri here. Let me just check that I've got all my indices right here, because this is easy to make a, yep, OK, I'm happy with that. But I think I prefer to label, I should label this by, so far I don't have to label this by anything, so let me 
just not labeled it yet. We'll get to that later. Okay. So what happens to the final column? Right? It was a whole row of ones, but I took row or column two, I subtracted from column one, so the first column gets a zero. Then column three from column two, that also is a zero. So over here, it's all zeros except for the very last entry. So now we're sort of in business, right? I've created again a row of zeros with the one at the very end. So that means we can just strip off all of that. So this is again i less than n, i is equal to n. Okay, so now we're getting very close. And let me just again double check that my bounds are correct, and they are. Okay. So now we're nearly, we're nearly done with that. So that's still this determinant. But I can make this now determinant on n minus 1, okay? Because as I said, this final row has zeros everywhere except for one at the very end. So just make this an n minus by 1, n minus 1 by n minus 1 determinant instead. And if I shift this, this is the same as r from, I'm going to get rid of that exponent there lambda j plus 1 up to lambda j, xi r plus n minus, I'm going to write this as n minus 1. I'm really happy about that because I want to get a sure function on n minus 1 letters. And then over here, I still have a minus j. Well, that's pretty amazing that this is I think it's going to work out fine. The last step, multi-linearity. So I can pull out all of these sums, right? Every, every column of my determinant, there is a sum. I pull all of these sums out into one big sum. And of course, this R here, now I know what I want this to be. For now, I'm going to call this a mu j. OK, I can do that. It's still just a dummy. But once I pull all these mu's out, a mu 1 for the first column, a mu 2 for the second column, and look at these beautiful interlacing conditions, mu j is greater or equal to lambda j plus 1, but at most lambda j. That's precisely the definition of interlacing. And once this is gone, this sum, that's just a normal determinant for the Schur function with partition mu. And indeed, n is being replaced by n minus 1. I have an n minus 1 by n minus 1 determinant. And this is the Vandermond on n minus 1 variables. So I get the same branching rule that I had from my Tableau description. Well, of course, we also have the same initial conditions. Namely that if I take a sure function, and I do this on the empty alphabet, okay, so let me write this statistically, right, x minus x, that's a zero, so that's how we would write that. You can check this from the tableau definition and from the determinant definition, of course. We, anyway, it's, we have just this, so it uniquely determines the sure function. We've shown it satisfies the same branching rule, so therefore these things are one and the same. Okay. Um, I want to make one, if I may, just two minutes, one final remark. So that's the branching rule. So now we have a determinantal and a combinatorial description. And as I said, the combinatorial description is really gives us much more information about if you care about things like representation theory. 
but I also would like to, after all there is, I mean, I haven't talked about probability at all, and I, I may not get there, although I've got some notes, so I promise to also upload those if you want to read about the Sure process, because I'm not going to get there tomorrow, but at least let's get to some integrability, okay? And Paul St. Justin will say a heap, heaps more about this next week, but just as a little warm-up for that. Okay, so to define, well, okay, the skew sure function. So how am I going to do that? Well, remember the branching rule. And I'm going to put this xn, I'm now just going to call it z, I'm going to put that back in. So we've seen that we have this, that's the branching rule, size of the difference of this, of this skew shape. Okay, and we can also write this just by definition I'm summing over all partitions, and you just call that thing the skew sure function. Well, this is a single letter, so I might as well just get rid of the platistic machinery. Okay. And so, all right, so in other words, S the skew sure function on a single letter, we can say it's either z to just that power if this pair of partitions is interlacing and it's zero otherwise. Okay? Okay, so, well, and more generally, we can write if I take rather than a single letter alphabet, well, yeah, it doesn't matter, it's symmetric. Okay, so again, if I now have the sum of two alphabets, I expand it in one of these two alphabets. Again, I just define the coefficients to be the skew sure function. And so over there you have it, what it is for in one variable. Okay, and of course just by iterating that, that one variable rule, you know what it is for an arbitrary number of variables. Okay, well, so what has this got to do with integrability? So let's now and that's the last thing I'll write on the board. Let's do this. So, okay. So let me take an alphabet and add two letters to it. And again, I'll use platistic notation. Okay? Let's see what's going to happen. Well, skew sure function of appeal of one letter. Let's say I take U, so I view this as x plus v is one alphabet and u is the other one. But now I repeat, That's one expansion, but 
Second expansion is I first prefer to get rid of my v. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll do this in one step because you've seen how this works. And then I get rid of u. It's completely symmetric, of course. So now take coefficients of s nu x. This tells me is equal to Okay, so now define T of U as the matrix with entries S lambda mu on the variable U. What do I get? I get somehow I'm multiplying two of these matrices. And let me call this suggestively, because that's what Paul will be using a lot, a transfer matrix. That's what people in statistical mechanics do. And let me call this variable here a spectral parameter, because that's what they do as well. And we see that we have commuting transfer matrices, OK? And if you're familiar with the Young-Baxter equation, or things like R matrices coming from quantum groups, that's usually the structure that tells you that these matrices must commute. Because essentially what you're going to do is you're going to hit this with some R matrix on the left, which allows you to commute things, and you get the R matrix coming out on the other side. So let's sort of say this is commuting transfer matrices. And so that connects to, as I said, R matrices, if you know what these things are, and otherwise you'll hear about them next week, and the Yang-Baxter equation, which is sort of the hallmark of integrability. Okay? So if you wondered, well, what has this all to do with integrability, as I said, Paul will talk about it for an entire week, and here's a first sort of quick connection with this commutativity business. All right, and I'm, I'm way over time, so I apologize for that, and we'll, we'll continue tomorrow, so thank you.